On to the 2024 offseason and the 2024 season. Who have the greatest odds at meeting in the Super Bowl in Super Bowl 59? And what is going on at the University of Washington? Some famous Nepo baby coaches being (laughs) amassed over there. And a whole lot more coming up on today's Peacock and Williamson. NFL analyst Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson bring you expert NFL analysis every day in less than 30 minutes. Get an inside look into the NFL on the field and in the front office. With elite breakdowns, next level analysis, and in depth information only for the real NFL fans. This is Peacock and Williamson, and it starts now. Welcome to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock alongside Matt Williamson at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We love all the everydayers. Make sure you are subscribed like the everydayers are on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcast. This episode brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's right, $150. If your bet wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. We had a question in the mailbag this week. What what teams do we expect to play in Super Bowl 59? And uh, it's a good question because we're on to the 2024 season now and the 2024 offseason. And coming up this week, we're going to talk franchise tags. The combine is coming up. Free agency in the new league year will open following that. And, of course, it is NFL draft season as well. And all these teams trying to figure out how they are going to get to Super Bowl 59 in New Orleans. So, Matt, uh, taking a look at the the – Super Bowl 59 odds that are up at FanDuel right now. And who do you think will be playing in the next Super Bowl? Yeah, I kind of just wanted to break down these odds a little bit. I mean, I'm not making a Super Bowl prediction for next year, but I do find it kind of interesting that there are three teams at the top. No shock there whatsoever. The Niners are plus 500. The So, folks, I'm not a betting expert, but if you lay down 100 bucks, you get 500 back if the Niners win the Super Bowl. The Chiefs are plus 750. The Ravens are plus 850. And I'll be honest, I'm, you know, thinking I've been hitting free agency really hard. I think the Ravens and the Dolphins are two teams that are set to get hit the hardest in free agency. The Niners look like they're in pretty good shape. They, you know, it doesn't, they look like they'll basically run it back to some degree. We broke them down last week and we broke down the Chiefs last week. I think there's a Chiefs. Or I think there's a chance that the Chiefs roster, especially offensively, pass catcher wise, is better next year than it is this year. So I'm a little shocked, and I understand you get a bump for being in the NFC, but I'm a little shocked that the Niners are clearly number one out of those three. There's a few things going on here. You mentioned the Miami yeah. Dolphins, by the way, Tua Tagovailoa. They got to figure out some things there, and that ties mm-hmm. into our conversation with the uh, franchise tags and, and many other things on tomorrow's episode. So you're going to want to tune in there. Um, the the 49ers are in the NFC, so the path's a little bit easier than it is for the yeah. Chiefs and the Ravens and the Bills, and that's why they're ahead of those three teams on the Super Bowl odds going into next season. But the other thing that's happened, and it happened with the Super Bowl betting odds, is that uh, in Las Vegas, there were so many bets on the 49ers to win the Super Bowl that they wanted teams, they wanted bettors to bet on the Chiefs so that Super Bowl line was probably a little bit skewed in the favor huh. of uh, you got a little better deal on betting on the Chiefs in the Super Bowl than the 49ers because they, you know, Vegas wants you with sports bets to bet 50 50 on they want the same amount of bets, uh, dollars on one side of a bet as the other side of a bet, right? And that's the whole, that's the whole scheme there in Las Vegas is they, they take, take the, the juice, yeah, yeah, they take the juice off the top and everyone bets 50% on this side, 50% on this side. And so for that reason, they want you to not bet on the 49ers, which is why they're the top betting favorite here. And I think it's going to be the same going through this season. So if okay. you're looking for the best bet, even though the 49ers have a really good shot at being there, and if I had to pick two teams to be in the Super Bowl, it'd be 49ers Chiefs again. Those are the best odds for yeah, a reason. Yeah. Like those are, the, those are the two best teams right now. They've been the two best teams over the course of five seasons. And so those would be the two best bets here. But I think the 49ers, if you look at any 49ers, Odds and they were favored in every single game last year. Like they're 
there's a there's a little extra if you if you feel like you should bet against the 49ers there's going to be just a little bit of incentive extra because so many people are betting on the 49ers right now okay i I didn't understand that and that makes sense you know like you kind of said it without saying it like if i had to put a dollar down on the chiefs or niners i would put it on the chiefs because it pays better and they seem to go every year. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, in, in, in reality, it should be maybe even. And so you're getting mm-hmm. just that little bit of a, a of extra. So if you like a team in the AFC, you know, the Ravens or the Chiefs or the Bills, for example, it, it's probably a better bet there because you're getting uh, you're getting better odds. You're getting twice as good odds for the Bills as the 49ers. Yes. Yeah. I mean, good point. So I do think that the Ravens as the third team are closer to the Super Bowl participants from last year. Then they are the Bills, the Lions. Those two are both twelve hundred. The Bengals. I mean, remember the Bengals? Remember Burrow? I mean, they're they may lose some stuff, but they're plus fourteen hundred. Dallas fourteen to one Bengals, and and so that's kind of where I want to go with this. Is like, what are those teams where you could actually get a big payoff here that aren't at yeah. the top of the list? And I think it kind of starts to make a lot of sense there. Lions are twelve to one. Bengals plus fourteen hundred. That's fourteen to one odds. Yeah. Are there any of those that you, you would consider like? The Bills worry me a little bit. Like, they are so good at their best. But I I think – I'm not saying they can't win the Super Bowl next year, but I do think the window is closing more than it's opening in Buffalo. So I, I wouldn't bet on Buffalo. No. Just because it's so hard to get through in the AFC and I'm not getting a, a, enough of a bump there. For Agreed. the same odds, I'd rather go, you know, Lions or just get better odds for a team in the AFC. Am I crazy? Because my pick last year was the Jets. The Jets are 30 to 1. Aaron Rodgers back. That's one that looked at me too. They got the one of the best defenses in the in the conference. Why not the Jets with uh if they get if they get Hall of Fame quarterback level play from Aaron Rodgers? And and I don't know there if there's a good reason, uh Achilles aside, that they wouldn't. It's funny. I was thinking the same thing. And you know, to, to pay off that big, you know, I put a hundred bucks down and I win three thousand. I could see the Jets. I also think that might be one of the hottest seats in the league, too. You know, like, I could see them picking first overall with a Rodgers injury. Yeah. I could see them picking 32nd overall if he's yeah. the MVP, you know? The Jets are the one team that could literally do anything next year. They could be the worst team in the league. Yeah. Coaching staff fired. They could win the Super Bowl. It, it's they pretty could win the Super Bowl. Yeah. Some other notables, I thought, were people have soured on the Eagles. The Eagles used to be in that conversation like we opened the show but they're plus 1,600, and they're tied with Dallas. And frankly, I think I would bet on Dallas before I'd bet on the Eagles. <sighs> I might take the Eagles just because you bring in someone like Fangio. I think there's a good mm-hmm. chance to fix some things. And talent-wise, they're still way up there. So yeah, I actually yeah. like probably if you start counting teams here that I would – put money on first i would say the eagles makes the most sense to me mm, okay Bengals as teams that are kind of a little bit forgotten right now i would go eagles over the cowboys if they have the same odds so you're looking at like the Bengals and eagles as a buy low opportunity like remember what they were at their best not long ago yep yeah recency bias is giving you mm-hmm. a little bit of a, a deal there um okay. certainly things could go a number of ways with both of those teams and the league is uh, remember this is this league is chaotic, and you think you know what's going on. You wait a month, it changes uh, immeasurably. You wait seven months for a new season to happen. I mean, we have no idea. So what about these teams at the bottom? I mean, the Panthers, I would say no, mm-hmm. but you're getting 250 to one. The New England Patriots, 200 to one odds. Uh, maybe the Commanders. What if the Commanders get a, a superstar quarterback at number two and, and add an ad- edge rusher in the offseason? How mm-hmm. far away are they from? being a problem in that division, maybe going far. Uh, what about the Steelers and, and Seahawks and teams like that, which were, you know, they've been playoff teams and they're 80 to one odds to win the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I did find that interesting too. So there are six teams that are plus 10,000 or greater. Denver, Giants, Titans, Commanders, Patriots, Panthers, as you would expect. But history shows, I bet one of those teams makes the playoffs. Like, I'm not going to sit here and predict it on President's Day, happy President's Day to all, which one it'll be. But history shows one of these teams that we left for dead probably sneaks into the playoffs, and then who knows. Now, I have to take a second here on the Steelers. They're the same odds as the Cardinals and Raiders. I mean, let's give the Steelers a little more credit than that. And I and put look, that a little here, personal. <laughs> and I would say this with the Steelers. There, there's a ton of talent, and they're going to have a good defense. They yeah. were already 
you know, that team that is really good quarterback play away from being a big time problem in the AFC. And they're not going to be worse at quarterback. Do they do anything at quarterback? That's what I'm saying, right? And, they're going to do multiple, something. There's been multiple reports, I think, in the same week last week, Matt, about, okay, uh, I think it was, what was it, ownership, right? That was talking about, we're going to add a quarterback. And then there was reports like, oh, they're split within the organization. If it's going to be Rudolph or it's going to be Pickett, and it's it's between those two. And there's not going to be mm-hmm. a, a big-time third quarterback brought in. So which is it for the Steelers? I mean, Pickett's the only one under contract today. Trubisky was released. Rudolph's a free agent. They're going to go to camp with four. That poor fourth guy might not ever see the field, period. But they always do. And I'm with you. I mean, just because of offensive scheme and the fact that they're going to do something at quarterback, they'll be better at quarterback. They're not going to be Mahomes-Allen level, but that's the reason they're obviously such long odds. If they get average quarterback play, I'm not saying they can win the Super Bowl, but they'll probably be a playoff team again. And if they get great quarterback play, they could absolutely win the Super Bowl. And there's a quarterback that was just suspended. I keep getting asked about that. I want to ask you about as well. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about him in a different Steeler, segment. Future Steeler Jimmy Garoppolo. I'm not there with that. Games. What's going on there? <laughs> PEDs. What, what? What is exactly happening here? And uh, we're going to talk about why it takes so long to develop NFL tight ends. Is that still a thing? I'm and... going to pop a question on you too. By the way. Oh yeah. Talk about Jimmy. Williamson's got a question for me, and uh, I've got a question for Williamson about what's going on with the University of Washington. All right. This episode of Peacock and Williamson is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Get buckets right now at FanDuel with your first bet on America's number one sports book because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's right. 150 bucks extra to play with at FanDuel if your first bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive NBA props, and a whole lot more. Major League Baseball spring training is going. That's going to be up soon. We've got NHL getting to the second half of their season, just like the NBA. And of course, those tasty, tasty draft props. One of my favorite ways to play at FanDuel. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. So Jimmy Garoppolo suspended a couple of games. And this is an interesting one because, you know, he's been hurt a lot. And the immediate thing when there's a story like this is you're like, okay, he's, you know, taking some kind of illegal substance to try to get back on the field, try to get healthy and try to play. And that could be it. But, um, even though it was part of the NFL's performance ha- enhancing and substances policy, everything's kind of put into one in this um, in this rule and and in this violation and a two game suspension for Jimmy Garoppolo. Which, by the way, given the terms of his contract, uh, Garoppolo's two game PED suspension wipes out eleven point two five million in fully guaranteed salary for Wow, I didn't know that. So, wow, uh, Jimmy, yeah, what are you actually, doing? This absolutely hurts Jimmy Garoppolo. But the nature of this suspension, uh, from what I understand, is more of a he didn't get league uh, clearance on something that is legal. I'm guessing this is like one of those Adderall things. And this has popped up a few times. it was a prescription. With, yeah, it's like a prescription that it's okay to take if you get the league's approval in advance. And he didn't have that approval in advance. And I know this has happened multiple times with Adderall. Uh, for different players around the league. So I don't know if it was Adderall or if it was something else. So it, it wasn't steroids or, or anything crazy. It wasn't, uh, you know, illicit dr- street drugs or anything. Mm-hmm. It, it's something pretty minor. Two-game suspension still for Garoppolo. Hurts him contractually and makes it possible that uh, – it makes it even more likely that he's not a Raider potentially next season. So that, that's another dark horse quarterback, Matt, and, and even another dark horse quarterback that we haven't talked about because we were asked the question last week about, you know, who's that – surprising quarterback that makes good somewhere else and you know the baker mayfield of last year and and mac jones in uh in new england is another one and could we even see jim g go back as a stopgap in new england mac jones goes somewhere else and and play better than he did with the patriots so uh, as the world turns as it uh as it pertains to the nfl this offseason there's no shortage of storylines it's good stuff Uh, and Jimmy should know better. I mean, if everything you said is true, which it sounds like it is, and he's respectable and smart and all that thing. I mean, every team has like a hotline or somebody you can call to say, should I take this or not? And they will tell you. And I think the league does as well. Like Jimmy should know not to put anything in his body he doesn't know about. 
which is a bit of a red flag to me because he is up in age and he's older. And kind of, as you mentioned, any player that starts to, that's up in age or or, injury has dealt with injuries and older, they really don't have anything to lose with true PEDs because if you get busted, if you need them to play and the only thing they can take away from you is your playing time and you can't play without them, then what do you have to lose? You know, like I always think of that guys that are trying to stick around for one or two more years, beat the system because they need them. I don't know that's the case at all. But, you know, I'm glad you mentioned Mac Jones. And I have a Patriot Niner question here on the tip of my tongue for you. I think Mac Jones in another scenario might resurrect himself. I'm not, I've never been a huge fan, but I am interested to see him go somewhere else. You know, and this leads me to the Steelers because I've been asked a million times, what do you think about Jimmy as being that guy next to the Steelers? And really, I, I lump him with the Brissett, Tannehill, Rudolph neighborhood now. Like, I don't think he's any better than those guys or more attractive at this point. Yeah. If I'm going, if I'm signing, if I'm a team and I'm interested in signing Jimmy Garoppolo, mm-hmm. I'm signing him to be stop gappy, someone who can start yeah. a game for you. He's not any kind of an answer for you. And you're bringing him in because he's going to be, you know, a pro. But, you know, maybe not if he's a knucklehead and he's doing weird stuff and taking substances he's not supposed to take and doesn't have clearance. Yeah, and he's always right. injured, too, which is tough because you, you might need him to play a stretch of games. Um, and he knows. And you he know, can't play the opening day. He you knows. Know, like, the, yeah. Right. He can't play the first two weeks. So that really, really hurts him as far as stopgap. Yeah. And uh, if it's him in a first round better. pick and the first round pick's not ready in week one, well, neither's <laughs> Jimmy. Right. Exactly. So that's, a, that's a terrible situation for right. him. Right. Um, or, you know, he's just a veteran that that can start games if you have someone else and you, you, he knows the offense and he can help you implement, you know, uh, Shanahan offense or, you know, if you're if you're running something, they used to run Earhart Perkins style in uh, in New England, which there's not that many of those teams mm-hmm. around anymore. Um, that would make sense for Jimmy, but he's in the he's the stopgap hiring right. backup quarterback era of his career. Yeah, he is. So here's my question for you. It's very Niner Patriot related. Forgive me if you've already discussed this or thought about it. And I stole this. I was listening to the Ringers podcast, football podcast. I forget who threw it out there, but it's been on my mind ever since. All weekend, it's been stirring in my head. Should Shanahan call Belichick and say, let's combine powers. It's like Yoda and the Emperor getting together. And, And Bill, the defense is all yours. I'm the head guy. But I will consult you, and I want you to be my game day manager to some degree, you know, my strategist and defensive coordinator, and those are all yours. We can even live in two different bedrooms. You can live on the other side of the building, you know what I mean? We could be a married couple, but we don't have to sleep in the same bed. My bed's a little bigger than yours. We're going to pay you a ton. Is that the move to get the Niners over the top? We have talked about this a lot on Lockdown Niners, but not here. And uh, I have the exact answer for you. And there's two things you said there. A, should the 49ers call Bill Belichick? Yes, 100% they should. B, would Bill Belichick be the defensive coordinator for the 49ers? Absolutely 0% chance that would ever happen. I think for a million reasons. Uh, None more than Kyle Shanahan doesn't want to win the Super Bowl. And then Bill Belichick gets all the credit for it. You know, he wants to get Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's egos there, yeah. If he's going to win... He doesn't want to have to give that credit away, right? Uh, the other thing is, Kyle's, the reason Steve Wilkes thing didn't work out is Kyle Shanahan essentially, I mean, he's the offensive coordinator, right? But, but mm-hmm. this has become the Kyle Shanahan defense as well. I mean, at, at a certain point, I, Kyle Shanahan might be pondering whether he should call the defense or not. Okay. You know Maybe I, mean? I should I think, do more, not less. Right. And that's the reason it didn't work out with Steve Wilkes. It wasn't Steve Wilkes' defense. Steve Wilkes was brought in to run the thing they have already developed Mm -hmm. in the lab over the course of seven years with Robert Sala and D'Amico Ryans. And D'Amico Ryans was part of that. He was in the lab for that. Steve Wilkes wasn't. So he was just forced to, here's our defense. You have to run this. And and I hate that. And so I think it's going to be someone more near to the the system that's been around the last seven years, whether that's somebody on D'Amico Ryan's staff or on Sala's staff or or just somebody that that gets a bump that's currently on the 49ers staff to be their next defensive coordinator. Uh, The biggest part of it, though, is... Kyle giving up the control and also yeah, yeah, yeah. the personnel and and the style of defense. If they ran the same defense, it'd be a lot easier. But now we're talking about an odd front. Now you're standing up Nick Bosa. You have different Bosa. personnel needs. Yeah. Uh, so for a million reasons, it doesn't make sense to me, uh, whether it's 
Belichick or Vrabel or anybody that runs mm-hmm. one of those three man fronts if they're not willing to run something sim- more similar to the personnel that the 49ers players that are already stars already know and already excel in. And the other part of it for me with the 49ers and their defensive coordinator spot is that uh, they're they're super close. They've already been good. They've got a lot of personnel that's that's ready to fit it. So I don't think Kyle Shanahan wants to shake up much. But Belichick, 100%, I could see being involved and being around as a part-time sort of consultant. It's like, hey, be a sounding yeah. board. Be a sounding board for Kyle Shanahan. Be a sounding board for where the defensive coordinator is. If he wants to stay close to football, uh, I know there's mutual respect between Lynch and Belichick and Shanahan and everybody. And because Vic Fangio did this two years ago in 2022, he was a kind of a consultant yeah, yeah, yeah. around for the 49ers and everybody assumed it was going to be Fangio as the new DC. He ended up taking the job in Miami and it was Steve Wilkes that got the job. Mm-hmm. Um, I was kind of blown away. I thought for sure it was hundred percent going to be Vic Fangio as the new defense coordinator. Didn't happen that way. And part of it is because Fangio is going to be the head coach of the defense. He's not going to let Kyle tell him what defense to run. He's going to run what he wants to run. So I, I don't think that part of it has changed, but Bill Belichick, Consultant to the 49ers, I could see happening, and Shanahan and Lynch should 100% make that call. Yeah, and maybe that is attractive to Bill to stay close to things. Don't you know? Always people won't think, oh, the game's passing goodbye, any of that type of thing. I mean, my obvious, you know, you said it better than I did, but my obvious concern was Shanahan's one of the biggest fish in the coaching sea, but there is a bigger great white out there. Do you really want him in your building? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it, it would be super beneficial probably to both uh, learning from each other. And, and if they could go exist. Yeah. They've both been in their own bubble. It's like, okay, let me pick your brain. Why do you defend this way? And what would you do to this offense? Mm-hmm. Bill Belichick and Bill Belichick could say, okay, I've been running the same offense and, and been doing my own thing over here for so long. Let me pick Kyle's brain and maybe I'll come out of this year off with a better idea of what I want to do with my yeah. new team when I get another shot when you're Bill Belichick. So and think about it from his perspective too. Maybe you're working 50, 60 hour weeks, not a hundred hour weeks. You don't have press conferences. You don't care if the field didn't get mowed that day oh, or you don't what's have going to, on. <laughs> you know, like all the- a porter the entire year, but you can still be involved right. in football. Just do some football stuff whenever yeah. you want. Yeah. I mean, there's probably 31 other teams that you could consider that. Too. Yeah, there's probably a number yeah. of teams that there's some mutual respect that he could play that role on. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, so. As long as he's willing to kind of check his ego, you know, like yes. not everything's going to go through you, Bill. You know, right. You well, right. don't even have to check, though. That's the thing because he, he's not involved. He just kind of kicked back and just mm-hmm. talk all and be involved. And it's like you can follow my advice or you cannot. And could I get to 90, talk. Could probably do 90% of it from home. Yeah. Oh, be, be in the yeah, right. be building whenever I want. Yeah. Interesting. Next, developing NFL tight ends and the nepotism is absurd on one coaching staff, and it's not even in the NFL. Next. This episode of Peacock Williamson is brought to you by Game Time. And when it comes to buying tickets to the next big event, whether you're getting ready for another NFL season, you're going to an NBA game, Major League Baseball game, hockey Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to that next big event. It should be exciting. And so with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes all of that guesswork out of buying tickets. My favorite aspect of Game Time is the all-in prices. You don't get hit with the hidden fees at the end when you think you're getting one price for a seat and you look and you're like, why did the price of my tickets I'm about to buy double as I'm checking out. It does not happen with game time. All in prices show your total up front. So you know, you're getting a great deal before you check out, you buy the tickets, couple taps right there in the game time app. You don't have to go fishing through your email when you do arrive at your event and zone deals. You pick the section and the game time picks the seats for big time savings. And those last minute deals. Don't forget about those. You can buy tickets right up to the start of the event. And even an hour after the event, Starts the place for last minute tickets. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Another great question we didn't get to in the last mailbag uh, that you wanted to address, Matt, is about NFL yeah. tight ends. And last season, we saw such a great 
rookie class of NFL tight ends and guys like Sam Laporta that developed much quicker than traditionally tight ends do. Uh, but Todd wanted to know, why does it normally take multiple years before most tight ends are able to produce in the NFL? And why was Sam Laporta so ready to jump in and produce the way he did last year? So I think most people, our listeners, are pretty smart and realize rookie tight ends don't hit their peak. They usually have a tough time. Second-year tight ends have a tough time. This isn't because it's a Niner Steeler thing, but the year that Vance McDonald came over from the Niners to the Steelers, I was sitting down with him in an interview, and I said, Vance, I don't know how much you know this, but tight ends, there's been many studies that tight ends hit their prime years right around age 27. And I think he was like 26 at the time. And he's like, wow, that makes a ton of sense. I'm a so much different player than I was as a rookie. I was swimming my early years. And then I was telling this story the other day on Locked on Dynasty that Eric Ebron's rookie year, I mean, that's how long ago it was. And he was a super prospect, top 10 yeah. draft pick at tight end. I mean, like before the Kyle Pitts of the world and Brock Bowers, there were Eric Ebron's and Kellen Winslow's and guys like that. But anyways, I remember very vividly. I used to be lucky enough to be at the Fantasy Summit at ESPN when I worked there. And I, from what I remember, there were 11 of us that got a vote. And for all you folks that play, you know, fantasy on ESPN.com and you see the tight end ranks, that's where they came from. 11 of us used to vote. It was Matthew Barry and you know, all the, the names you would remember. Most of us are gone. But I remember Eric Ebron coming up. And it was the it's like a three-day event, the, the fantasy summit in ESPN. It's like, you know, it's a big draft room and everyone's fighting for their guys. And Ebron came up, and that was the biggest discussion of the whole year. You know, we are not putting a rookie tight end in our top eight or top ten. Here's all the data that just kills the, you know, it just backs that up to no degree. And I forget where we landed, but Ebron did nothing as a rookie. And, you know, don't trap Eric Ebron as a rookie. So it's funny that that's why I brought this up, though, because over the last year plus, I think those rules are changing. I think coaches are finally getting smart and saying, I'm not going to ask my tight end to be half tackle and half slot receiver and know all the protections and have the strength to do that and, you know, block Nick Bosa and Miles Garrett anymore. I'm going to move them around and get them into, you know, the Niners are great at this. We're going to make them Kelsey. Is Kelsey really a wide receiver or is he a tight end? He's somewhere in between. You're going to call it 11 personnel or 12 personnel. It's really 11 and a half is what it is, you know, and that, that causes problems. And I think the league has adjusted to that. And I think the days, I'm very open to the idea that the days of rookie and second year tight ends won't produce in the fantasy world. And I'm old enough to remember third year breakout wide receivers. Oh, wait, don't, don't draft that receiver until his third year for fantasy. That, that seems stupid now, you know. I think pass catchers, whether it's yeah. tight ends or wide receivers, are more ready to play now than they ever have been just because yes. of everything they go through as a youth and in college and you know off-season stuff and seven-on-seven. Seven, there's so much more passing work that happens and, and guys are 100%. ready to play and, and run route trees uh, quicker than ever. And as long as you, and this is the key with the, with the Sam Laporta thing, as long as you are a willing blocker and were asked to do something as a blocker in college, and some guys are not, then that then you're going to be ready to play a, a lot sooner. And I think that was part of the key with Laporta is he was a complete prospect. He wasn't maybe the most crazy height, weight, speed guy that got him drafted in the top 10, but we see a lot of those guys take a long time. And, and a lot of those busts at tight end with the first tight end taken because of that reason, because it's a lot more upstairs, even if you're you know not an inline guy that's asked to block defensive ends all the time, there's going to be blocking assignments and and someone like Laporta was willing to do all of that, and it's it's almost like running backs where if, if you don't get on the field early as a running back because you're bad in pass protection, they can't trust you. As long as yeah. they can trust you in the, in the blocking realm as a tight end, uh, and obviously in the NFL, there's more offenses that are not asking their tight ends to block as much, so it makes that transition a lot easier. I also still believe that I believe forever that tight ends, good tight ends fade away slowly. You know, you can play deep into your thirties when you develop that old man at the Y game and you know how to get rebounds. And, you know, the, the, I'm talking about basketball analogy here, but like Gonzalez, Gates, Gronk, Jimmy Graham, like the, the great ones, even Kelsey, you know, like even when you're not Witten and not even when you're not what you used to be, you still know how to sit down in zones and box out and you can fade away slow as a tight end once you've mastered your craft. You can't run anymore.
Last note here, I, I just had to bring this up because I'm kind of blown away by what's going on at the University of Washington. And head coach Jed Fish is putting together his staff after uh, you know that there was staff changeover and uh uh dude went over to uh Alabama to replace Nick Saban, right? So uh Washington, such a fantastic season, you know, Pac 12's going away. But Jed Fish is now the head coach there, and he's putting together a coaching staff. And his latest hire, Matt, was uh, it was Jake, I couldn't remember his first name, Jake Lynch, former Stanford linebacker. And I did not Go know ahead. that Jake Lynch played linebacker at Stanford. Why should anybody know who Jake Lynch is? Well, he's the son of 49ers GM and Hall of Fame football player, John Lynch. Who also played at Stanford. Right. Jake Lynch which, I mean, if we're talking about why Jake Lynch is at Stanford in the first place, I think we can start <laughs> right, right. the That's same like nepotism the road, which is, yeah. it's not, because we used to say the NFL is the nepotism football league, right? Um, it, it happens in college as well. So Jake Lynch, son of John Lynch, has joined Jed Fish's staff in Washington, and he joins Luke Del Rio, <laughs> Brandon Carroll, and Steve Belichick on Washington's staff, the sons of Jack Del Rio, Pete Carroll, and Bill Belichick. And I am wondering what kind of favors Jed Fish is preparing to call in at his uh, when he's done coaching at the University of Washington. And he did say that he's trying to put together an NFL-style staff for his coaching staff in Washington. But, the, I mean... It's almost a joke at this point with with uh, with, with, with you have four, you have Bill Belichick, John Lynch, Pete Carroll, and Jack Del Rio's kids all on your coaching staff at Washington. I mean, uh, and forget you know the you know how any of these guys got to the point where their resume could say they could join the staff that they're on currently. I mean, it just gets ridiculous at some point. That's crazy. I knew none of that information. I have to go back in the Williamson way back machine just for a second here, though, because my three years at Pitt, this is like Antonio Bryant, Larry Fitzgerald years, folks. I mean, Flacco's coming out of college or out of high school. We had Brendan Carroll on our team. He was a Pitt Panther. And you know why? Because Walt Harris, our head coach, gave Pete Carroll his first job ever at Pacific, and they were really good friends. And Pete calls Walt and says, my son's not good enough for a scholarship. Can he walk on a pit? Sure. Couldn't play dead, but he couldn't play dead in the cowboy movie, but that's fine. He's a good dude and you know, learned how to coach apparently. And it's amazing. So you start to build your resume and it starts with something you didn't deserve. In a way, and, yeah, yeah. And it makes the next thing easier. So yep. maybe you didn't deserve that. And the next thing, and maybe you end up being a great coach. And it happened with Kyle Shanahan. And I say Absolutely. it all the time. Right, and right. It, you can say that Kyle Shanahan's an amazing NFL coach and would sure as heck have not gotten an NFL head coaching job in his late thirties. If his last name wasn't Shanahan, he wouldn't have been a wide receiver at the university of Texas. Uh, Cause he wasn't a great wide receiver. And he wasn't <laughs> right. a big time athlete. Right. Um, he wouldn't have been, uh, he wouldn't have walked out of college and onto John Gruden's staff in the NFL as that a first uh, job's the key, the GA right. job or the, yeah, right. right. And he wouldn't have been an offensive coordinator in the NFL in his twenties. You know what? Well, yeah. you know, maybe he would have gotten to the NFL because he's obviously a good coach. But it's how you get there and and how you're able to put these steps together in the beginning and get those first opportunities, which are the most difficult. Um, but with with what Jed Fish is doing right now, I'm just wondering, like he's he's got to be like eyeing something else in the NFL and trying to call in some favors because this that's, is that's this is another level. Could help recruiting though. I mean, recruiting's huge. I mean, you got can't help hurt recruiting. I know we're going to wrap this up, but trust me, I'm jealous of those guys because my path couldn't have been any different. I didn't even have an old coach to call and say, what do I do now? Like, I didn't yeah. know who to ask, you know, let alone anything like that. But I will say an advantage that those guys have is their whole life, their dad, whether he's a good coach or not, lived the NFL coaching lifestyle. Like, it doesn't shock you. You know the commitment. You know, dad's never going to be home. He's not going to be at your baseball games. He's not taking you to the movies. He's not picking you up for McDonald's. You know, like you do know what you're in for. And a lot of people that get into coaching don't, you know what I mean? The commitments. and Right. Yeah. And and obviously you do learn some things about coaching along the way. And, and there's a huge benefit no there and not even that. Then that's a, a great benefit to becoming a good coach ahead of even getting opportunities that other people don't. Yeah. 
But that's insane. I'm glad you brought that up. That's yeah, it's just, I had to bring it up because it's it's it, it has to be called out a little bit, and it's just uh, it's just wild. So Jed Fish, I, I don't know what you're up to, but there's something else going on. <laughs> he's, gonna, he's gonna call in some favors. All right, thanks everybody for making us your first listen on the Locked On Podcast Network. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcast. Matt and I back tomorrow. What to do with Tua? Should they pay him? Should they not? And taking a look at some franchise tags as the deadline looms. Talk to you then right here, Peacock and Williamson.